will admit I didn't start out my career thinking much at all about being a woman in work, <laughs> in the work <laughs> environment. Um, I thought about being a person and someone with high ambition in the work environment. Everyone has a diversity story, even those you don't expect. Welcome to The Will to Change with Jennifer Brown. Get ready to hear from leading CEOs, best-selling authors, and entrepreneurs as we uncover their true stories of diversity and inclusion. And now here's your host, Jennifer Brown. Welcome to The Will to Change. This is Jennifer Brown. Today's guest is Alexis Krakowicz. Alexis is a partner in McKinsey's financial services practice and leads McKinsey's Silicon Valley office. She advises financial institutions, leads the firm's banking organization practice in the Americas, and co-leads McKinsey's Women in the Workplace Research Initiative in partnership with LeanIn.org. Alexis also serves as faculty at McKinsey's Executive Transitions Masterclass and Change Leaders Forum. She counsels executive teams on improving top team performance in their organizations and is a graduate of the Stanford School of Business. Also relevant to our interview today, Alexis is a mom to three daughters. Alexis, welcome to The Will to Change. Thanks for having me, Jennifer. I'm thrilled to have you. Um, We're going to talk about your uh, company's research in a little bit that you've been so intimately involved in, which is groundbreaking. But before then, we always like to start The Will to Change conversations with um, our personal diversity stories. And uh, I know that you have lots of daughters and have a real personal connection to the work that you get to do around uh, gender equality in the workplace. So tell us a little bit about your awakening to feeling very mission driven about the work you do and getting the message out and having the, um, dare I say, occasionally tough conversations about um, equal opportunity for women in the workplace. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, You know, it's very interesting for me to reflect on my own journey because I will admit I didn't start out my career thinking much at all about being a woman in work, (laughs) in the work (laughs) environment. Um, I thought about being a person and someone with high ambition in the work environment. But I honestly, uh, as the product of both my parenting and my schooling, Um, through the 1990s, I really felt like uh, I was going to enter a workforce that was already balanced in an equal playing field for women. And so my personal awareness, uh, I would say, was actually quite low. I remember um, my father's side of the family is Russian and Polish. And I remember when I first told my grandparents that I'd gotten a job after Stanford, my grandfather, who was quite traditional and had grown up in Eastern Europe, said to me, well, how do you feel about taking a job away from a young man? who might need it to support his family. Oh. <laughs> what a weird question. And I said, well, I, I feel thought about good. it. I feel quite good because I'm going to support myself. Hello. <laughs> um, but at the time it just struck me as, as odd. And, you know, and when I entered the workforce, I graduated from a class in university that was very balanced across women and men. I entered a first job where my entering class of analysts was very balanced between women and men. And I really felt like when I saw leadership across many companies that was not diverse um, in terms of gender, that it was really just a matter of time. That if I waited until I got there, I would look around and I would see all of my colleagues who were there reflective of the colleagues who had started with me. And so I was really surprised to get to senior leadership and discover that that wasn't the case, that the complexion of senior leadership still looked a lot more like what we'd seen 20 years before than what I had envisioned 20 years into the future. And that was probably the first moment for me where I realized that the pace of change that we're achieving is just not fast enough and that we're going to have to think about it differently. That's right. And so, I mean, that's a perfect segue about the studies that McKinsey has undertaken um, and how many, the sheer number of companies that you've included in that work, um, endeavoring to really catalog the problem um, or the opportunity, as we say in the business world. Um, And so, so tell us a little bit about like, what did you all set out to study? And, um, you know, if you had to describe, you know, why is it a problem that women are being left out of leadership positions and the cost to employers and organizations at a high level? How do you how do you describe that in a way that um, balances not 
making people feel defensive about the very conversation because I think, I don't know, I, I find a mixture of denial and anger and um, confusion, but also genuine curiosity, like literally not knowing the facts um, mm -hmm. when I tell people about um, the data that's out there. So tell us a little bit about the studies. Sure. So the research that we have under underway now is a multi-year partnership with Sheryl Sandberg and LeanIn.org uh, to create across McKinsey and LeanIn really the definitive benchmark of gender diversity and the data underpinning our progress on diversity in corporate America. And what it's based on is we are now entering into our third year in 2017 of a body of research where we work closely with companies across the spectrum of industries to understand three things. The first is what is their actual pipeline of women and men, of uh, people of color? What does it look like and what does the progression of people over time look like in a long longitudinal way? So help us get a snapshot how that breaks down by industry and sector and roles. The second thing is understanding what are the policies and programs that, that they're trying to make advancements on that they feel are working for them or not working in terms of improving that complexion of talent. And then the third, which I think in some ways is most exciting and powerful, is asking employees themselves, women and men across all levels of organizations, what are you perceiving and experiencing in your own work environment in terms of how well companies are delivering on that promise of what they're trying to achieve in terms of an equal playing field, um, eliminating unconscious bias, creating equal opportunity for all. And so the data that we've based this on in 2016, our Women in the Workplace report had 132 companies, very much of what you'd see in terms of a, a cross-section of industry and size of companies in the U.S. participating, and over 37,000 employees uh, sharing mm -hmm. with us their personal experiences and perception about the work environment. For 2017, we hope to have over 200 companies and over twice as many employees participate. So it's a very exciting body of research. Oh, I'm just so glad that you all are, are putting it out there and making it so tangible and practical. And also um, that you there's an accountability, the link between what we say we're about as a company and the lived experience of employees in those companies, which is often where a gap exists and yes. um, gets to sort of the, the big difference between setting bold um, and best practice or next practice policies uh, versus the sort of culture, right? Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, you know, how do we how do we close that gap between what we aspire to be and and even perhaps what's concretely like baked into our, you know, company practices and the fact that sometimes the feedback comes back and it's not very positive around how that's perceived. Right. And I think that's a struggle for so many companies today, right? It, it, we have evolved, I'd say even in the past five years as we've been engaged in a lot of this research from a world where a lot of companies were saying diversity wasn't a top priority or was one amongst many, many other priorities to diversity and inclusion being viewed as a top priority uh, for the institution. Over 75% of companies that we survey say it makes their short list of priorities at a company-wide level. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important because as I talk with different organizations about why diversity, you know, there, there are multiple answers to that question. Of course, there's a reason that's just, it's the equitable and right thing uh, to do, but there are lots of things that are the right thing to do that don't get the resourcing or attention they need to really accelerate and make progress. I think in addition on an issue like diversity and inclusion, there's also a real performance view, which says that if I want to attract the top talent, in a competitive environment like we face today. And if I want to get the most out of my people, including the best outcomes, the best decision-making, the most innovative thinking, then I will need to have great diversity in my workforce at all levels in order to achieve that. And mm -hmm. I firmly believe that. And I believe that the companies that are gonna make the fastest stride, um, fastest progress on this issue are the ones that also believe that today. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Yeah, so that gap is is a really interesting one, and we'll keep we'll keep kind of exploring all that um, when we talk about um, you know employees still feeling like they need to distance themselves from some of the more um, stigmatized behaviors or identities in the workplace. And you know, until we kind of you know create a sense of safety um, for people to actually 
bring more of their full selves to work, utilize some policies and, and you know, available uh, benefits, for example, that are available to them, you know, we're not going to really have this shift. So it's it strikes me it's always a, a top down and a bottom up dynamic and also a middle out dynamic, too, in terms of what happens in the day to day uh, manager level of companies, too. So I'd love to dig into the key findings from the research, which is available for free download, and then we'll let our listenership know where that exact link is. Uh, but Alexis, what are the the key findings that you think generate the biggest, you know, gasps from the audience when you present this information? They could be things that um, we thought maybe we'd fixed or solved for in the past, uh, things that impact women dramatically different than men or diverse talent differently than, than others. Um, what are some of those really shocking findings that you want people to really pay attention to when they read the research? Well, the big punchline of the research from our first year um, was that it will take over a hundred years for women to reach parity in the C-suite relative mm. to men. So that progress has effectively if not stalled entirely, slowed dramatically from what I think most people's expectations were, mm. uh, certainly over the past decade or more. I would tell you that when I share that fact, most women in audiences are not <laughs> surprised to hear it, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but many men are. Uh, and I think that's because there's really a gap today in the perception of a lot of people of to what degree have we, quote, already solved this issue. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think most women who are still participating, um, progressing, competing in the workforce at uh, more and more senior levels feel a set of headwinds that I think in many cases men don't experience. And because they don't experience it, don't have the same awareness that they still exist. And that's a lot of what our research really uncovered in terms of what's behind that number and um, what are the reasons why we're still seeing these headwinds that have really slowed down progress so dr- so dramatically. And there are a couple of points that I would highlight. The first one is what this isn't about. So there's a general perception that attrition is a strong driver of why you see less women at the top, that effectively they self-select out or drop out of the workforce at much higher levels. We found actually that company level attrition is not a driver. In fact, Women are more loyal over time to their company as they progress to more senior levels than men are. This was really shocking to a lot of people because Mm -hmm. there's a sense of, well, if women aren't at the top, it's because they're opting out. I do think that when women exit companies, they are more likely to exit to do um, to take on more flexible roles or move into positions that they can control, like individual entrepreneurship Um, becoming their own personal operator. And men are more likely to job hop, which we do see in external hiring, that companies at senior levels hire in more men than women um, and actually exacerbate their problems with diversity. But the fact is most companies are not losing their women at high rates. What they're not doing is they're not progressing them quickly. And that lack of progression starts right at the beginning. So one of the other things we found that's quite shocking to a number of people is that the first promotion matters a lot in most companies. And in fact, across all the companies we looked at, on average, for every 100 women who makes that first promotion into management, 130 men do. Mm. So right out of the gate, you already have a situation where women are falling behind. Mm. And I think the reason this is particularly surprising and was surprising to me is, you know, we're talking about early in career. So in many cases, the These are younger folk, often are millennials uh, in that population are highly represented. Uh, For many women and men, this is um, at a point in their life where they're uh, pre-family start, Mm. right? So it's not yet the dynamic of having children. And you don't yet have the complexity of senior level politics, right? Where networks and and leadership and sponsorship uh, are probably playing a significant role in those promotions. So the fact that you see, you know, despite all of those things not being present, you see such a big discrepancy, I think is particularly alarming. Mm. Um, the third thing I'd cite that the data really shows is that there are a number of ways in which women describe experiences that feel materially different than men do. So in 
small but important ways. Women cite uh, situations where they feel that they're not able to participate in meetings as often or as frequently, uh, that they don't receive the challenging assignments, that they don't feel like their contributions are valued as equally, um, and they're not turned to for input on important decisions. And so, and I think that describes a pattern that when we interview women, they reinforce, which is a sense that there's somehow a way in which they're not as completely embedded in the flow of the informal currency that really matters to build a strong position over time towards leadership in many companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, that, that all sounds very familiar from the questions that I'm asked when I speak on this topic and the level of frustration of feeling like If I say, if I challenge a behavior or a decision that's made or not being included and I kind of push into that, that I am going to be maybe penalized or unfairly stigmatized, you know, the whole, you know, squeaky wheel, the becoming, you know, synonymous with, um, you know, your, your gender as opposed to the quality of your work. But it's a, it's a very slippery slope because you know, we tend to be, if we advocate for ourselves, we are judged in a really different way. And, and yet if we don't challenge it, what are some of the other ways around that to challenge the behaviors that we see happening around us? But at some point, we just can't always be the one that's raising them. I think, I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, an important insight we came to in our research last year was the realization that increasingly women are taking the advice that they're they're getting broadly to advocate for themselves. So they're lobbying for promotions, they're asking for compensation on on levels that are on par or even a bit higher than men. But what's interesting is that we see a level of blowback associated with those behaviors that we don't see at the same level for men. So when women ask for a promotion, they are far more likely than men to then find in their performance reviews that they're described as bossy, aggressive, intimidating, right? Negative language that crops up elsewhere as a response to the self-advocacy. And I think this puts women in a particular bind because the the data on the pipeline says you're going to have to champion yourself or you're not going to make the progress. In fact, today you're not um, making those early leaps at the same levels. But as soon as you do, because it's inconsistent with our belief about how women and men should play into gender, you know, gender roles, we see that we see a penalty come back around. And I think that's a particular challenge for women. That we Absolutely. Need to solve. Yep. And, you know, so first of all, let's, let's focus on what we as women can shift in ourselves. Um, and I know, you know, some of the, the interesting feedback about lean in was it, it very much, focused most of its energy on how we can show up differently to shift that dynamic. Um, And then the counter of that, of course, is that the organization needs to rise to meet us, right? To There needs to be an openness and a commitment to women showing up differently in order, before they show up differently. You know, otherwise, I think it's, it becomes a very risky proposition as you're describing. Um, And so, Do you think in your study, do you think there are things women can play differently uh, and need to play differently and shift in their mindsets and in their, their maybe self-beliefs about, you know, how to navigate these waters that, you know, may or the rules that may or may not have been built by them, but by which we all need to be successful. (laughs) Um, So, so what are your, what is your viewpoint on that balanced with how much the organization around them needs to shift and their colleagues need to shift? Yeah. It's such a great question, um, and I think challenge for women. There are three things I really focus on at the individual level that I think can be quite powerful, um, and I, I certainly have found for myself. The first one is being thoughtful in how you construct your network as a woman. So there's a lot of emphasis placed on networking. A lot of companies think about ways to connect their women. Um, and there's a very important piece of that that's about creating connection across women, because by definition, as you progress into more senior levels, there will be less and less women in most companies um, Mm -hmm. holding those roles. And so creating a sense of community and connection with women is really important. But one thing we see in our research is that women are far more likely to have a network that's um, all women than men are, 
right? Mm -hmm. And men are far more likely to have a network that's all male Mm -hmm. uh, than women are. This makes sense when you think about, you know, people tend to be attracted to people who feel most comfortable with people like themselves that where they have commonality, things to talk about and share. But what's important for women is that over time, as you progress into senior leadership, if you don't broaden that network from being thinking of that as a network of women to a network of leaders, a network of sponsors, a network of supporters, Mm -hmm. in whatever form they may come in in your company, Mm -hmm. you end up unintentionally narrowing yourself in terms of the people who can play that role for you in a way that can be potentially quite limiting. And so the encouragement I have for women individually is think about the people in your, in your corner and think about how you make sure you get the breadth of support that you need over time and really focus on creating a network of leadership that's there to support you as you progress and making sure it's balanced to represent the breadth of what your company has to offer because it'll give you the maximum access to opportunity. And I think for women, that's a really important step to take. The second one I think is really important is we find that while women and men ask for feedback uh, at the same level, that women receive critical feedback. So the, the type of feedback that's really focused on how to improve your performance over time less often than men do. Mm -hmm. And that's really important for growth, right? You need to know in order to improve, not only the things you're doing great, but you need sharp clarity on the areas you need to improve in order to achieve the next level. And my encouragement for women themselves, the piece you can own on that is when you have performance dialogues or when you have interactions with your manager, make sure you ask the questions that get for you the feedback that you need. And recognize that if you don't prompt it, you may not receive the full breadth of insight that would really be helpful to you. So be prepared to ask the question, what's the one thing I could do to improve my skill set mm-hmm. and take my performance to the next level? Mm-hmm. Don't just say, how did I do? Because mm-hmm. you might get back, you did great. Right? <laughs> you just some of what we see. And then what we what we hear is that, you know, that on the margin, managers, both female and male, right, are inclined to soft pedal tough feedback for women. And when we do that, we miss the opportunity to give you the the skills you need to grow. And so I think that's the second piece that's that's really important for women to keep in mind and something you can really own and control. And then my last piece of advice that's very personal is, you know, thinking back on myself when I was starting out in a career, looking forward at the leadership level, I spent a lot of time trying to think about how to Uh, model my behavior on what I saw because my pattern recognition said what's at the top today is, is what must be the definition of success to get there. And I think in order for us to believe there's a world with more diversity in senior levels, we have to believe there's a world with more diverse leadership styles. And so my encouragement to women is to not constrain yourself to say, if I don't see it today, that must mean that it can't exist in terms of the type of leader that's Mm -hmm. the future of the company. But to actually say, I need to help shape what should be there in the future. That's right. Oh, I love that. I mean, we always say she's got to see it to be it. And with a lack of role models of all kinds of what I call non-traditional leaders, we make the assumption then, and, and it becomes a belief over time that nobody that looks like me is, is able to be successful to that degree. And I believe the the connections that bind us to companies start to break and the trust starts to break at that moment. And it continues to, you know, fracture like death by a thousand cuts, becoming one of the only uh, people, for example, that look like you that gets promoted, you know, and, and you know, becoming the only at the table um, and looking around and realizing, you know, you might have really succeeded and beat, beat the odds, but the isolation of it, I think is very exhausting. And, um, I think that's where we've got to make sure we're monitoring, you know, the pipeline very, very carefully and and honestly walking the talk when it comes to the kinds of policies that are welcoming for all kinds of talent and all kinds of families, for example, as well. Um, I one of another thing I, I'm really passionate about is I think, you know, equal 
all all of this knowledge that we're talking about building into our organizations are good is good for men as well and male leaders. You know, it's work is not work doesn't work for a lot of people um, in the current iteration. And so um, I, I wondered if you would share a little bit about how men are also shifting their expectations of their, how they play their roles, what balance is defined as, and, you know, how we are making this actually bigger than just a a, a conversation about women's development, but actually for all leaders and kind of fundamentally redefining what that's going to look like in the future. Absolutely. I, I think one of the very important pieces of this puzzle is the fact that we hear a number of men also saying that the current construct of leadership in many companies, of work expectations, that they struggle with that as well. So we find nearly a third of men uh, say they don't aspire to the top roles because they don't think they embody the typical style of a top executive, that they feel the definition of leadership is too narrow to embody them. We also find that not only do women say that the single biggest reason when they, uh, the single biggest reason they don't have for reaching for the top jobs when they don't, when they don't want it is stress and pressure and balancing family commitments. But men say that as well. So this isn't an issue that is just confined to women. I firmly believe that when we solve some of these questions on both leadership diversity and expanding our profiles of what strong leadership looks like and also work-life balance and how to make that work in a modern era, that we will be solving this for women and men equally. And that's a, it, I think it should be an even greater call to action for companies to emphasize this, and many are, because they've realized that this is really how you win the talent game of the future, right, for everybody, is to create an environment where there's a sense of inclusion, where there's a sense that uh, diversity and perspective is really valued and drives better outcomes and also where you recognize that people are looking for a whole life which includes uh, a thriving career but is not limited to just that that's right and i loved your story about how you challenged yourself to uh, not gloss over the need to have time to go to a you know parent teacher conference you know i think a lot of people camouflage and hide hide the fact that they're balancing so much behind the scenes by saying, "Oh, I'm not available. I have another meeting." You know, you at some point made a made a choice to say, "I'm going to show up and talk about and be transparent about the 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 myriad of priorities in my life and how I am balancing it all." Because that I think another way we can do a disservice to those who are watching us as leaders, because all eyes are on us, is acting as if everything is easy and somehow we have it magically figured out. And um, when 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 it's very far from that case, and I think, um, but the pressure to make it all look easy, I think, is really strong. And so the 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 concept of revealing how the balance is actually done on a mechanical level, I think is is part of leadership showing up transparently and also redefining what that leadership really looks like. So am I representing that that story correctly? <laughs> is that no, that's that's absolutely right. I, I think one of the great benefits of working in professional services is the ability to create flexibility in your schedule. And I certainly feel like it's one of the powerful things about being part of uh, an institution like McKinsey, uh, and it has kept me here over time is the ability to have self control <laughs> mm-hmm. over my destiny. But mm-hmm. I, I realized a few years ago that we have a lot of asymmetric information when we work together in a workplace that we can either exacerbate or reduce depending on how we choose to talk about it and the degree of transparency we bring. And what I mean by that is there are many situations where I spend time with teams where they see me show up, where I've taken a red eye or I've stayed late or I've done something extraordinary to spend the extra time that's needed to be with them and to support uh, to support clients the way I want and need to. And what they don't see is where I take back some of that balance in my own schedule in ways that work for me and work for my family. So they're not with me two days later when I volunteer at the school or drop my kids off or show up to, you know, make milkshakes 
as a part of a class project. Uh, because by definition, they're not in the room and they're not looking at my calendar and seeing that there are all sorts of things I do to create balance that allow me to play a role, uh, the role I need to play as a leader, but also the role I need and want to play in my family as a mom. And I think it's really important that we start sharing some of those stories and we bring some of that transparency into the workplace Mm -hmm. as vulnerable as it can make, make us feel if we can't share the ways that we make it work, uh, people will believe that it's not, it's not possible. That's right. Well, what do you think would enable more men to take full advantage of, uh, the increasing amount of parental leave that is given by companies and, I mean, when we look at Europe, of course, they get a, a, a crazy amount of time off. And in fact, I believe they get penalized if they don't take the time off, particularly uh, fathers, I think. Um, but in the U.S., we can barely take enough uh, vacation time, right? We don't need, we're a country that doesn't even utilize what's given us. So we have, we have that whole characteristic about our culture. But, but what would, what would destigmatize uh, parental leave, for example, for men. I'm so curious because I, I do have my theories, but it is kind of a different way to tackle that problem of that, the stigmatized identity that's associated with people who take leave and all the stereotypes that are made, which have, which have hurt women, of course, and continue to, but what would make the difference for men? Because I think that would, will create a big shift that we haven't really seen yet. Well, I think what's quite interesting is that we see such a gap between uh, what men and women do when it comes to parental leave. And I, I feel like that's a clear signal of the disconnect between where we have a policy on paper intended to achieve a certain outcome and we have a reality behind that of how that plays out in the day to day that uh, where there's a disconnect between the two. And when you have a policy saying you have access to parental leave and a, let's say, a generous policy for um, for men to take parental leave on par or similar to women, but you don't see your employees uh, taking advantage of it, that is a sign that there's something about that policy that isn't working for you in practice the way you think. Because many women don't really feel like they have a choice. So if you have a child... <laughs> or, you're, or, you, or you, you know, adopt a child and for a period of time, you're the primary caregiver at home. You really need that time for recovery, for, um, for caretaking. Right. And, uh, and so many women take advantage of it, but then they experience what they feel like is a penalty on the back end when they try and reintegrate into the workforce. I think many men see that and they, they worry about that same challenge. And it's one of the reasons you see the uptake and we do in our research the uptake on those programs to be much lower than you would expect if everybody was taking advantage of them in equal form. And so the reflection that I think is important for companies is where do I think that disconnect is and what are some of the steps I can take to, to minimize it, right? And there's some, there's some that start at the individual level. Are we role modeling the behavior with our leaders in visible ways? So when our female leaders, uh, as parent take parental leave, do they take their full parental leave when our male leaders uh, have the opportunity for parental leave? Are they taking it and demonstrating that it's okay? I think that's one piece of it. But I think another piece of it is to really understand how do these programs play out in practice? And when we say reintegrate, what does that mean? And does it work on paper? But if I went and asked 20 people in my company about their experiences, would they describe to me something that was much, much more challenging than that? Uh, that I haven't really yet thought through. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think I think it's true. We've got to see more leaders doing it, and then many, many will follow in their footsteps. I think it. This is one of those things that senior leaders, especially, need to really be cognizant of the optics of the choices that they make and the message of, you know, whatever it is, if, you know, it's like the same as working 80 hour weeks, you know, and the tone that it sets or the expectation of being on email at two or 3 AM um, and always kind of keeping an eye on it is always set from the top. You know, these things are um, the power of leaders behavior, whether it's stated or not sta- stated is going to be interpreted as, as the norm. And, you know, but with a subtle shift, I think, um, those among us who are cognizant of all of your research and have really l- taken a hard look at their own gender expectations, 
it can start to push back against those expectations of their gender and and make some different choices and frankly challenge each other to make different choices. I always am fascinated and, and really recommend that men who are gender champions, gender equality champions have a huge role to play in terms of the conversations they can have with their peers, with their male peers and with their male colleagues. And that conversation can be honest um, and different because there will be a, a a character to it that is unique. It's a communication between two men. And um, and I think it, it can go a long way in terms of um, making people revisit their assumptions, their behaviors, the impact of their behaviors, um, and, and in a safe place too, because I think um, the sort of shaming factor is not as intense when it's a private conversation um, from one man to another. Uh, there is there there are a lot less feelings generated around it. I find it's it can be it can be more straightforward, and um, certainly if it's a senior man speaking to a junior man or vice versa, there's still some political um, you know nuances to it. But but the but those conversations, if they were to happen with no woman you know involved in the conversation, I think if we could have more of those, I believe we would see more behavior change. But you know, I wonder how many of the, how many of them are going on behind the scenes that we're not really privy to. <laughs> well, an important piece in what you just said is the element of having men at the table. I think in a lot of companies, the, the place much of this started was convening women to talk mm-hmm. about women's needs. And that's important, uh, certainly to get perspective from the source. It's also important to create a community for women, like we talked about, mm-hmm. but you, to solve this, you really need everyone at the table because mm-hmm. you first of all, you're solving. I firmly believe for everyone that as you create greater diversity, you will create, uh, an environment where everyone wins, um, and feels more included and more able to bring their full self to work. But Secondly, in the current pipeline and complexion of most companies, the majority of senior leadership positions are still held by men, which means the majority of levers to drive impact and accelerate uh, accelerate change reside with men. And so you will never get the progress you want unless you have men fully at the table and fully in the conversation. Mm-hmm. And as you noted, that requires a degree of trust and openness and a willingness to have conversations where not everyone's going to get it right the first time. Mm. Yeah, that's right. And there's got to be, I mean, it's been interesting to watch um, everything that's happened with Uber um, over the last couple of weeks, even, Um, you know, comments that were made that were swiftly, there were swift penalties related to, um, you know, something that started with the blog post. So I think we are seeing, we are seeing an accelerated cycle um, around, uh, consequences for not understanding this, not taking it on board, uh, not kind of monitoring your environment for behavior and and other cultural factors that are you know um, negatively impacting certain members of your workforce. And you know any leader that's kind of not paying attention to all that and, and isn't aware of the 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 gaps that we've been talking about today, you know that the research is all over the place. And so sometimes it really surprises me when I talk to senior leaders that aren't kind of aware of the basics that are covered in your report. So I will absolutely urge everyone again to read um, McKinsey's work on women in the workplace um, and make sure, you know, you've got some of these stats that we're talking about at your fingertips and, you know, far, far beyond, you know, being fun cocktail chatter. Um, did, like, did you know this, you know, that they're only 6% of the fortune 500 is, is female CEO, female CEOs, um, you know, beyond the shock and awe, it is, it is really let's let's get together and talk about what we can do, particularly as men, to shift this. And and I and I think we're starting to see more of that. But I, I think we've got a long way to go. And 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 I wanted to ask you too what your opinion is, Alexis, on on the pushback, on the resistance that sometimes you find. Um, I know I get the question when we're talking about. Uh, diverse candidate slates, for example, when I'm talking about um, who's not at the table, who's not included in key decisions, who's not being mentored, et cetera. Um, when when I get the question, are you telling me that we effectively do we need to, you know, hire the diverse candidate or do we are you suggesting that we have quotas around our hiring and promotion practices? And and this can it can get into a tricky situation and conversation, of course, because um, maybe the question is, 
you know, are you telling me all things being equal, I need to make different hiring decisions and promotion decisions and, and really prioritize the the non-traditional candidate or the diverse candidate? You know, and I would love to hear your perspective on how do you how do you tackle that question? How do you reframe it? Um, and how do you understand it? Because I think people will be on the defensive and say, I don't, I believe in a meritocracy. I believe that, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. I hire the best person for the job. You know, I don't want to be forced to hire somebody that, you know, I, I don't know, I don't feel comfortable with. So I think there's a lot of this narrative, whether it gets set or not, it is, it is in the air. And, um, I wondered what you say, perhaps backed up by the data and all your knowledge, you know, what do you say to that and how do you reframe the conversation so that people actually end up really being excited about the opportunity to hire and promote diverse candidates at every juncture? Right. There's a important and I think very real reflex reaction to questions around diversity, hiring, promotion that get at the heart of what you described on meritocracy and a concern that we will actually violate those principles mm -hmm. um, in, in this work. And, you know, one of the most common frames is, well, I, I don't want to swing too far in the other direction and suddenly be awarding opportunity to people who wouldn't otherwise receive it simply in order to feed a diversity objective. Mm -hmm. And I and the reframe that's important there, in my mind, is one that says this is not about disproportionately awarding people uh, opportunity where they haven't earned it. It's actually about eliminating the unintended biases that are built into the system because of how it was constructed, because of some of our pre-existing stereotypes that we're not even aware of. Uh, be, because of some of these compounding factors that we, we've been talking about. It's about unwinding some of that that is today leading us to unintentionally uh, bias the results that we're getting. Today, we have an uneven playing field in, in how uh, things, things play out, right? We have individuals who are not appropriately uh, achieving the opportunities, the promotions, the access that they should for reasons we don't intend. And the goal here is to change that so that all companies get to take advantage of the best that their talent has to offer, that they get every time the opportunity to take the, the best, right, and most deserving candidate and give them the next shot. And we get that right and we create, I think, believe a more motivated workforce, but also a better selection process for our talent that gets not only more diversity at the top, but a closer link between you know, the actions and performance today and the outcomes that, that we want to reward and want to see in the future. Mm -hmm. That's the important reframe that can be quite powerful in companies is to say, look, today things are happening and there's noise in the system that you, you don't actually intend and you don't want, and it doesn't yield the best result mm -hmm. for you. Because of that, let's change that dynamic so you actually get the best flow of talent to the top. That's right. That's right. And um, lastly, I wanted to ask you related to that, um, your data shows that there is um, the answer to the question, do you know what to do to play your part in gender diversity? Right. I know, And it was so amazing and not surprising, though, that the answer is both women and men don't really know what to do to play their part. So, you know, we might have increased awareness and, and your study obviously does that to, you know, really effective degree, but what do I do now is always this question. And I get that. And I'm like, how much time do you have? <laughs> I mean, I wrote like in my book about like, there's so many things you can do large and small and, but how do we play our part once we're awakened to the issues and we're passionate, we're well-intended people, but it's really not enough. You know, I always say we've got to be more proactive by courageous actions, bold behaviors, um, people who are willing to take risks on behalf of others, you know, all of those things. So when, when folks come up to you and say, okay, I'm, I'm awake, I'm passionate, I want to put my skin in the game, um, what are some things I can do? Where can I get started? Let's, um, let's hear a couple of what you think are the high yield activities that folks can undertake. Well, the data point that you're referencing that I agree is quite striking is that only 51% of managers say they know what to do to help improve gender diversity. And when only half of your workforce that's 
at the the pivotal role of leadership in deep in the organization knows what to do the thought that you're going to see widespread change happen on a significant accelerated pace is very unlikely right so the real question on the table is how do we arm people better to take action and one notable example of that is when we ask people you know do your managers challenge biased language when they see it occur three quarters of people say no they don't see that happen so Mm -hmm. one step everyone can take managerial position or not is just what you said about playing a personal role and being an advocate for the right behavior in the workplace. So having the courage to, to challenge and pause when you see something happening that doesn't look or feel right. Mm -hmm. And what's important there, I think to be, make it productive is to recognize the vast majority of people I firmly believe are not intending to create a negative or non-inclusive environment. In many cases, they're not actually aware of how their behavior is doing it. The whole premise of unconscious bias is it is unconscious. <laughs> and therefore, there is a, a very low, if zero, level of awareness around it. <laughs> and so I think we need to start with that premise and recognition that most companies, most leaders, most individuals are not starting out to create an imbalanced environment. It's what we're inheriting as a result of a lot of pattern build up over time. And when we see things that don't look right, first, we need to have the courage to challenge it. But secondly, we need to be prepared to have an open dialogue about it. One that is, you know, is not uh, accusatory, is not emotionally charged, but is really focused on the constructive, which is, you know, how do we build from here forward? I think that's one thing everyone can do. I, I think the second thing everyone can do is think about the ways you can role model and be part of the the future pattern, not the past. So mm-hmm. for men, that may be taking advantage of uh, parental leave policies and being vocal about the fact that you're doing it, why you're doing it, in order to create more acceptance for it. For women, it may be playing a part in helping articulate for the company where policies are working and where they're not, uh, where uh, integration back from leaves is proving particularly hard or where you don't feel like the support mechanisms are in place. It can be a really important piece, bringing some of that transparency to how you do make it work. And I think for everyone really pushing yourself to expand your circle of, of connection points, we are, we will always be as humans wired towards people who look and seem like us. There's something in the familiar that's very, welcoming, encouraging, uh, protective. How do we all find ways to make connections to people who, who seem different? Because as soon as we start doing that, we expand everybody's network and awareness and, and we create a much broader degree of familiarity. Mm, I love that. I always learn so much from you, Alexis. It's beautiful <laughs> and a perfect, perfect ending to something called the will to change, which is the title of this podcast, which is you know, the awakening of purpose in us to take on some of these issues that are really harmful. And I think holding our organizations back and holding, holding ourselves and our families back as well from reaching our full potential. So, um, you know, may you continue to ignite the spirit of change in your audiences with your research. And um, for those of you who want to download the report, womeninthe you'll see Um, the latest research. And um, Alexis, thank you so much for your voice and uh, for leading the way on this conversation. I really appreciate it. Jennifer, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Hi, this is Jennifer. Did you know that we offer a full transcript of every podcast episode on my website over at jenniferbrownspeaks.com? You can also subscribe so that you get notified every time a new episode goes live. Head over there now to read my latest thoughts on diversity, inclusion, and the future of work and discover how we can all be champions of change by bringing our collective voices together and standing up for ourselves and each other. You've been listening to The Will to Change, uncovering true stories of diversity and inclusion with Jennifer Brown. 
If you've enjoyed the episode, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. To learn more about Jennifer Brown, visit jenniferbrownspeaks.com. Thank you for listening, and we'll be back next time with a new episode.